Welcome to the sequel of the ambassadorial series, Deans of US-Russia Diplomacy. I'm Hannah Notte. No decade was more decisive for shaping post-Cold War US-Russia relations than the fateful 1990s. Who can claim to have a more unique and intimate perspective of the forces that shaped this relationship than United States ambassadors to Russia? Jack Matlock, Thomas Pickering and James Collins served as U.S. ambassadors to Moscow. From the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991 to President Putin's ascent to power a decade later, they were eyewitnesses to Russia's tremendous transformation after the fall of the Iron Curtain. They were also actors in that history. They met and negotiated with the highest Russian officials, traveled throughout the country, interacted with Russian citizens. In this sequel to the ambassadorial series, we will learn from three deans of US-Russia diplomacy. They will share their personal experiences in navigating the challenges in the US-Russia relationship during the 1990s, Russian domestic upheavals, and regional and international developments that would come to trouble the relationship. And we will take a step back from those events to reflect on missed opportunities, ways forward, and recipes for successful U.S.-Russia diplomacy. Just after Christmas, I called on um, Ambassador Falin, who then was head of the Central Committee, uh, uh, that he was known as sort of Mr. Germany as far as their foreign policy is concerned. And I asked him, I said, I understand you, uh, that you think this is a question for the future. His answer was, we thought it was a question for the future, but it's clear now it's one that's going to be resolved now. As history turned out, Ambassador Jack Matlock was to be the last ambassador of the United States to the USSR. He served in Moscow from 1987 until 1991. Ambassador Matlock arrived in Moscow as a seasoned career diplomat, fluent in the Russian language and well-versed in Russian history literature and culture. And it's from that perspective that he counseled Presidents Reagan and Bush. This, as the Cold War was coming to an end, the Berlin Wall was dismantled and Mikhail Gorbachev was fundamentally changing the Soviet Union. Ambassador Jack Matlock, thank you so much for talking with us today in the sequel to the first ambassadorial series. It's a real honor for me to speak with you today, having read your books, having heard you speak many times in the past on US-Russian relations. After your distinguished career serving the US government, including as ambassador in the Soviet Union and in Czechoslovakia, you actually wrote quite extensively about Soviet US and then Russian US relations as well including in your books, Autopsy of an Empire, Reagan and Gorbachev, and then also your latest book, Superpower Illusions, which have given me great inspiration for this conversation today. So thank you again for doing this. Well, thank you. And thank you for reading my books uh, before asking your question. It makes them much more pertinent. Ambassador Matlock, let us start with history. In your books, you draw attention to three crucial events towards the late 1980s and early 1990s, which you believe have been frequently misconstrued in terms of their causes, their interrelation, and in fact, who should take credit for them. And those events are the end of the Cold War, the end of communism as a system of rule in the USSR, and the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. And in fact, uh, nowadays, it seems to me indeed that the term end of the Cold War is used interchangeably with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I'd like to ask you what, in your view, 
give rise to this intellectual laziness? Why does it matter? And which misreadings of history have been most consequential for the trajectory of the US-Russia relationship since then? You know, that's an excellent question and, and one that I, I ask myself at times. But I think that the reason so many people, there are several reasons so many people are confused, I think, and look at uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union as the end of the Cold War. Now, the Cold War ended before that. And um, as I watch that process, but as I think about the perceptions, almost no one among the specialists uh, predicted that the Soviet Union would break up. Uh, many doubted that Gorbachev's reforms were real. Uh, even as they became more and more clear that they were. And the events moved so rapidly, particularly between 1987 and 1991, that it was very hard even for specialists to keep up. And for the general population, all of these steps seemed to have come as a surprise. But it seemed to me very clear that the rationale for the Cold War ended uh, by uh, December 1988, uh, specifically when uh, Gorbachev, in effect, he gave up the Marxian class struggle uh, theory as a basis of Soviet foreign policy. After that, it was just a matter of cooperating to clean up the, many of the, uh, the results of the Cold War. And then because the Cold War was over and pressure on the Soviet Union, uh, external pressure decreased, it gave Gorbachev a chance to try to reform the Soviet system. Uh, that got out of hand when too many in the Communist Party began to resist him. And yet he had sufficient control of the party because of tradition that despite everybody's expectation, he actually acted to take the party out of total control of the country, which he needed to do if it was to reform. And as this was developing, national nationalism in the various republics, including the Russian Federated Soviet Republic, began to increase. And the, uh, also the economy, in as much as they were trying to uh, reform an economy uh, which operated on almost the opposite basis of a market economy, that the uh, economy uh, was failing to produce and distribute even basic consumer goods. So they had an economic crisis for the average people a rise in individual nationalisms. Um, and uh, just as you might say, the controls, the force controls were being taken off. So that I see that the, the, uh, the second of these great uh, uh, movements were actually uh, in, uh, motivated internally. Uh, uh, and, the, and they were, Gorbachev had, you might say, the maneuver room to try to reform because the Cold War was over, because those pressures were there. If we had not ended the Cold War, I think we would still have the Soviet Union. Now, it might be a failing state, uh, but uh, I think it would still be there. Uh, because as long as the Communist Party and its instruments of repression, uh, the the KGB, the, uh, the military, uh, stayed loyal, uh, they were going to repress uh, any change. What happened here was the leader of the Communist Party used his position to take that party out of control. Now, that is something nobody expected uh, in the West, uh, and many people doubted as it was happening that it was genuine. But by 1991, these processes had reached such a stage that uh, by the end of the year, of course, 
uh, the Soviet Union itself collapsed. Well, part of that was the effort by the very people who were supposed to secure the Soviet Union, the head of the KGB, the head of the military, and the prime minister conspired to try to stop the reforms and stop the creation of a voluntary federation. Uh, and that so weakened uh, 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 Gorbachev and the union that uh, it did fall apart uh, in December. And I might say that as far as the United States was concerned, we did not want that to happen. Uh, we did not consider it a victory. Uh, but, you know, you can understand why people would. It happened fast. It happened unexpectedly. It happened for reasons many thought were impossible. Uh, but suddenly it was clear the Cold War was over and that the Soviet Union itself had not survived as a unitary state. Uh, and uh, then, you know, the media immediately seized upon this uh, as uh, the end of the Cold War. I recall in the late 1990s previewing a, uh, a documentary that was later shown on CNN and others, which shows the end of the Cold War uh, with the Soviet flag coming down in the Kremlin and the Russian flag being aroused. And I told the producer immediately, that's not when the Cold War ended, it ended earlier. And he said, well, but that's not very dramatic. And I said, look, are you writing drama or are you writing history? It was clear he was writing drama, but he was also conforming to the usual perception. And it, it's an understandable perception. But as you say, it is one that reflects a certain laziness in looking closely at the facts as they transpired. Now, why has this been a problem? Well, by looking at uh, the end of the Cold War as a complete victory for the West, uh, some drew the totally unfounded conclusion that, well, this proves that the system we have in the West is the future of the world. It's, it's suitable for everybody. Uh, then Francis Fukuyama's famous uh, book, uh, uh, The End of History. Uh, you know, it reminded me very much of just a variant of Marxism-Leninism. Actually, you know, uh, Marx had predicted that there would be a proletarian revolution which would ex extinguish and eliminate the bourgeoisie uh, uh, and create uh, socialism, uh, sort of a utopia for everybody. And this was really uh, the fundamental of Stalinism, uh, Leninism and Stalinism. Uh, it was really the basis of what we call the Brezhnev Doctrine. When the Soviet Union, for example, declared the policy of it was their duty uh, to support and uh, expand what they called socialism uh, everywhere because that was the future. You know, I recall once when Foreign Minister Gromyko came to Washington and President Reagan asked him directly, he said, uh, do you still believe in a one world socialist state? And Gromyko said, well, of course. He said, but if I believe in that, it's like believing that tomorrow uh, the sun will rise in the east and set in the west. It's not something we have to help. But it, others said differently. Uh, when Reagan, in his first visit with Gorbachev, uh, complained about some of the military interventions in Africa and Latin America, Gorbachev answered, we're simply doing our international duty. Uh, that, uh, you know, and get used to it. <laughs> this is the future. Well, you know, he changed his mind on that, thank goodness. But my point is that uh, by uh, saying that, well, democracy, and I have to put that in quotes because we never defined it precisely, is the future and it is our duty to spread it. And what's the problem with that? Well, first of all, there's no evidence that the same form of government is going to suit everybody in the world with such different histories, customs, 
uh, social structures. Um, in fact, uh, the, the evidence, the pragmatic evidence is to the contrary. But second, even if that's the case, there is no way an outsider can uh, create for people a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Only a people can do that for themselves. And if you really want to spread a given form of government, how do you do it? You show how it works at home. And I'll tell you, it's not working very well at home. Today, maybe precisely because we have presumed that we can, by using force, by using sanctions, uh, that we can change other people's political systems. I don't think that's possible. And though I know that the people who believe this uh, believe it, and it is, uh, uh, but I think uh, it creates more problems uh, than it solves. Uh, so I think that by misunderstanding how the Cold War ended, by treating in particular Russia as a defeated country, in effect, without any national interests, um, uh, that uh, we are have helped create and exacerbate the problems we have today. This was fascinating, Ambassador. So many important elements uh, and moments here. Uh, I do want to come back to some of those er uh, later in the conversation, um, particularly the Brezhnev doctrine and the notion of democracy promotion. For the moment, I want to stick a little bit with the end of the Cold War and the early 1990s um, and ask you about the implications of the collapse of the Soviet Union for the Soviet people. I read Autopsy of an Empire, and you start that book with a fascinating anecdote. You recount the 25th of December 1991. You, you mentioned it just now. Um, the day that Gorbachev announced live on TV that essentially the Soviet Union was gone. And you then used the example of Gorbachev's assistant, a young Soviet diplomat from Georgia, to point to the cognitive dissonance that millions of people must have experienced at the time. You write, he no longer knew who he was. He was Georgian and he was Soviet, and there had been no contradiction. What now? So I want to ask you, considering the many implications of the USSR's collapse on the level of identity, economic organization, governance, which ones were the most significant that Western observers, Western officials really needed to make an effort to understand at the time? And perhaps which implications remain least understood even today? Yes, well, there were so many factors operating then. And frankly, I don't think there's a way you can usefully quantify uh, to say, well, certainly the economic collapse was extremely important everywhere. The rise of nationalist feeling uh, based upon um, one's uh, uh, native language primarily uh, was certainly quite perceptible in all, including uh, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, but, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, uh, for different individuals, different things were more important. And extreme nationalists would sometimes uh, um, simply use economic uh, difficulties uh, for their own ends. Others, uh, for them, the economic difficulties would be paramount. Uh, and uh, so that uh, different people had uh, different priorities, had different uh, push. And uh, I think Gorbachev thought, and actually many other people thought, that during the uh, 70 years of Soviet rule, they had created, you might say, a new Soviet person. One sort of based more on ideology uh, than on uh, ethnicity. It turned out that was not the case. Uh, the ideology sort of uh, crumbled 
under them. Uh, people had already most stopped believing in it, uh, even while it was the official thing. But you know, this leaves people with a very difficult thing to face, and that is, who are we? Who are we? Are we Russians? Or are we something broader and different? Well, we're facing this in the United States today. We should be able to understand. Uh, I mean, uh, we too, you know, some of our groups for a long time uh, had been at least implicitly white supremacists. Now that's no longer working in the United States and it is a traumatic experience for many of us defining, you know, what is an American um, as a white American uh, somehow superior or more authentic uh, than a black or brown. Um, and so, you know, I think that uh, we need to understand that uh, there are many different pressures uh, pushing probably the most prominent uh, of these in uh, not only the national republics, but in the Russian Republic itself, was a feeling of ethnic exclusivity. And, you know, we can see that since the breakup of the Soviet Union, in many of the republics, the dominant nationality has suppressed its minorities. In other words, it's unwilling to give its minorities uh, the sort of, of equal rights uh, that they have. I mean, Georgia was attacking uh, South Ossetia even while the Soviet Union still existed, uh, for example. Uh, and of course, we had the uh, Armenian Azerbaijani um, fighting even before the Soviet Union collapsed. And these things all got worse after it did. So, um, you know, there were so many forces going on at the same time that Gorbachev was having to deal with a, a totally different international situation. After all, he began to encourage reforms in Eastern Europe. And when these reforms led to a downfall of all the communist governments, he accepted and even welcomed that. Now, that was something that, again, nobody had predicted in the past, uh, though it was actually in the Soviet interest to do so. Because, you know, nothing weakens a country more than trying to control people that don't want you to control them. That's something we don't understand today <laughs> in so many issues. I would say Ukraine is better off without Crimea because most of the people in Crimea prefer to be in Russia. And yet, pardon me for jumping ahead so much, but uh, the problem here is the one I'm pointing to is uh, the, the idea that so many have that, uh, well, you know, we, uh, we define our identity uh, on the basis of ethnicity rather than a broader concept. Uh, and this is something that, quite frankly, I think most of our countries are going through, but it was forced upon the people of the former Soviet Union very rapidly and uh, in ways that uh, some were hurt more than others. Any time of rapid social change, this is going to be the case. They're going to be losers, they're going to be winners, and if they fight too much among them, everybody turns out to be a loser. What was most important? I, I suppose I, it, it was really the, the combination of the rise of, I would say, ethnic nationalism uh, uh, along with the deterioration in economic conditions for average people. Thank you for that, Ambassador. Um, I do want to come to a slightly different topic, which is that of arms control and nuclear weapons. Yes. Ronald Reagan dreamt of a world free of nuclear weapons. And as you note in your book, he was also deeply affected by the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. Yet at the same time, he launched the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, in 1983, I would like to ask you two questions on this, if I may. The first is really, why did Reagan do it? Why did he launch the SDI? And did no one in his administration realize, anticipate, 
perhaps even warn against the deep concerns that this effort might evoke on the Soviet side regarding the deterrent value of their uh, strategic offensive arsenal. And the second question, if we fast forward a little bit, we then did have some progress on arms control into the early 1990s with the START treaties, with the Lisbon Protocol, with the presidential nuclear initiatives. Why was that momentum lost with Clinton administration? Well, the first question is that uh, the reason President Reagan became enamored of the Strategic Defense Initiative was his total hatred of nuclear weapons and his a total rejection of the theory that our policy was based on, mutual assured destruction. He would say, how can you tell me that the only way I can defend the American people is by killing millions of innocent people elsewhere. I cannot accept that. And when he was told that there is a possibility of a, uh, of a defense that could defend against uh, ballistic missiles uh, that, that might be developed, uh, then this, uh, he thought, would make it possible to reduce and even eliminate nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, because if you had a defense against them, uh, otherwise, even if countries agreed to reduce them, who knows whether some, as he would say, some future Hitler uh, doesn't arise and decide they're gonna build them anyway. And if you don't have defenses, what can you do? And as he said, you know, we banned chemical weapons after World War I, but we kept our gas masks. Uh, so in his mind, uh, there was nothing inconsistent. And he really couldn't understand why others would think that this was a, an offensive strategy. Now, what I think actually some Soviet scientists uh, actually tended to dismiss it as not a threat so that was not a universal view in the Soviet Union. Uh, others said, look, it's impossible to have a completely effective defense. Uh, there, and th th that is actually true uh, because uh, these uh, defensive systems are very vulnerable. They depend upon satellite communications and you take those satellite communications out, they don't work. As Sokharov said at one point, the problem with uh, uh, with uh, strategic defenses is that it's easier to take things out of orbit than it is to put them there. And uh, so the irony is that although Reagan's belief was sincere and he felt this very deeply, technically it would not have worked to be a threat. So uh, now on the Soviet side, as I said, some actually advised, don't worry about it. It's not going to work and, and uh, that way. Uh, others said, no, we have to do it because if it does work, uh, look, you know, it will mean that our, our missiles uh, uh, w w will be useless and, and they could uh, attack us. Well, oh, they could attack us and then defend themselves from, <laughs> well, that too wasn't. Uh, others said, look, this is just a cover for an offensive uh, thing. What they want to do is put nuclear weapons in space, which was never a part of this program. And of course, it was prohibited by international agreements. But I think many in the Soviet Union, particularly in the Politburo, they were not very technically competent. And I was told later by you know senior uh, uh, Russian officials that, uh, well, you know, our people really did think this was an offensive strategy. Uh, Reagan was convinced it wasn't. Uh, and so um, we had this case. Now, for some of Reagan's advisors, I mean, like uh, uh, Bud McFarlane, our national security advisor for a while, for him, it was a scam uh, because up until then, uh, the Soviets had always uh, insisted 
that any reductions be proportionate. But they had developed a, an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, which number one was mobile, which means you could move it from one place to the other. Number two had 10 warheads that were very accurate and could easily take out our land-based ICBMs, which were single warhead. So it became part of uh, the basis of our policy to try to get a great reduction or possible elimination of these ICBMs. At one point, Reagan actually proposed that we both eliminate all ICBMs so that we wouldn't have weapons. And then if we had defenses, that would be against other people. Uh, Gorbachev never accepted that, never even took it seriously. But the point is that, um, uh, that uh, we were worried about the theoretical possibility that their ICBMs which we could not target in advance because they were mobile, uh, they were sufficient to take out our land-based deterrent because they were all in silos, had a single warhead. So then the first plan was, okay, so we'll build a mobile ICBM. Uh, the one we planned had only three warheads, not 10, because uh, the Soviets had greater lift capacity than we did. You know, Americans always seem to assume that while we have superior technology and we'll keep that superiority, that of course has been disproved time and time and time again. Uh, but uh, and this is another example of it because in our first arms control agreements, um, our military wanted to preserve the right to MIRF, that is to put multiple warheads because we were ahead in that technology. 10 years later, the Soviets were ahead in that technology and we wanted to reduce or ban them. <coughs> so, um, uh, the, uh, this shows, so both sides were making miscalculations. However, we found that it was going to be impossible for us to develop and deploy a mobile ICBM uh, uh, in the United States because it had to be passed by Congress. And who in the world is going to vote to have ICBMs moved on our railways or our reinforced superhighways? Nobody. I mean, you don't want them in your backyard. So it was politically impossible for us to develop a counterpart. And so McFarland said, okay, <laughs> we've got to fool them. We'll say, we'll build a defense that negates yours uh, if we don't reduce them. So in that case, <laughs> Uh, he looked at it as, uh, in effect, a scam. Uh, 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 and, uh, and at one point before Reykjavik, and at Reykjavik, Reagan actually said, okay, uh, let's both develop defenses and agree to eliminate our ballistic missiles, not just the intercontinental, but all ballistic missiles. And Gorbachev never considered that. Uh, he thought so uh, he's how would we ever get agreement to do that? Well, it would have taken Reagan overruling most of his military people to do it, but he was capable of that while he you know, was in office. In any event, I'm rambling on a lot, but just to point out that these issues were not all that simple, that motivations differed on both sides, that in fact, in Reagan's mind, and in fact, the Strategic Defense Initiative was not a threat to the Soviet Union. One can understand, and uh, if there's not any basic trust between them, there would be those who uh, would um, uh, uh, doubt that and uh, suspect that. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, that's why he hung on so long. And uh, let me say frankly that uh, if we had not had the problem of what they call the Iran-Contra uh, controversy just after the Reykjavik meeting, we were on the verge of accepting Gorbachev's proposal that he made at Reykjavik. And if we had not lost our senior officials who backed that in the Iran-Contra dispute, we very likely would have accepted Gorbachev's proposal 
uh, to uh, uh, keep SDI in laboratories for 10 years. That was my recommendation when I got back to Washington. It was accepted by the National Security Advisor, but he got up in, all, in Iran-Contra, got dismissed. And um, it shows how, you know, domestic politics, other issues often intrude. So bottom line, uh, SDI cannot work as it was envisioned uh, by um, Reagan, but it was not a threat uh, to others as he envisioned it. In the early 1990s, so after Reagan, we oh, have yeah. some progress uh -huh. also on arms control. Start one, start two, the Lisbon Protocol and the presidential nuclear initiatives. Yes. But then this momentum gets lost during the Clinton administration. Why was that? Why was that momentum lost on arms control? Well, you know, that's a question for the people uh, in uh, the Clinton administration. It was a great disappointment as far as I was concerned uh, that we didn't proceed. I recall strongly recommending that we uh, come to an agreement with uh, then the Russian Federation uh, to eliminate all short range nuclear missiles from Europe. And um, I know the man before he was defense secretary, but uh, later he was uh, uh, Clinton's defense secretary said, oh, we can't do that. Uh, the West Europeans, our allies would, uh, would not agree to that. And I said, are you telling me that they're going to insist we keep weapons in Europe that if they are used are going to be used against them? I mean, <laughs> And short range nuclear weapons in Europe made no sense at all. But the Clinton administration was concentrating on other things. And I must say the people who earlier in the Democratic Party had been strong on disarmament were not very prominent in the Clinton administration. Uh, there was too much feeling of oh, triumphalism. We've got to show that uh, uh, we're number one uh, that, uh, oh, the 20th century is the American century. Uh, and um, uh, uh, they were much more interested in, uh, in most, as most politicians are, in satisfying their domestic constituents. So, as I said, I, I think it's too bad we didn't proceed with much more radical reductions. I think that would have been possible then if we had not been willing to do it on a fair basis, but we didn't. And then very soon we began to have the issues such as the expansion of NATO, which probably made further reductions in nuclear weapons virtually impossible. This is great, very clear, Ambassador. Um, I want to stay with the early 90s for, for one other question and come to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in August 1990, which provided one of the first tests of the developing US and then still Soviet uh, relationship under Gorbachev, especially if you consider that Saddam's Iraq had been a long-standing Soviet ally. And as you note in your book, Gorbachev passed the test. He went against some of his Middle East advisors and ensured that the Soviet ambassador at the United Nations supported the United States in condemning the invasion of Kuwait, and then also in supporting the legal basis for what became the first Gulf War. So I want to ask you, Ambassador, um, Ambassador Matlock, how was Gorbachev convinced to go against his advisors? Who convinced him? And how was the first Gulf War then perceived among the Russian people at the time? Well, first of all, Gorbachev didn't go against his principal advisor, uh, the Edward Shevardnadze. It was Edward Shevardnadze that agreed with us that if one country invades another, you've got to oppose that. And as he would say to his own specialists, if your friend makes a mistake, you must not defend him. Uh, and the fact is, this was blatant aggression. Uh, and uh, we had the vote you know, of the UN, uh, and we had the vote of almost every Arab country, except uh, maybe Jordan, uh, to go after Saddam Hussein. And this is one of the most basic 
I would say, rules of international rule. One country doesn't simply invade and take over another without any cause whatsoever. Uh, now, this was a difficult decision for Gorbachev because, as you say, many of his advisors were still looking as if, uh, you know, the whole matter of the Middle East was a competition between uh, the Soviet Union and, and the West. Uh, and actually, the problems there were much more insoluble. Uh, many of them, if it had been possible for the two of us to solve them, we probably would have, but it wasn't. Uh, but anyway, uh, what he saw was at that time, um, he was then increasingly in need of American support. He was having more and more difficulties at home. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, um, uh, the uh, and Bush uh, actually met him in Helsinki to discuss that issue and got his commitment uh, at least to abstain in the Security Council, not necessarily vote, but abstain to make it possible. And China also uh, agreed to, because this was a, an issue of blatant aggression. I would also say that uh, Bush, when we carried out the Gulf War, which we did with cooperation with about 45 countries, uh, once he liberated Kuwait, he stopped. He didn't go to Baghdad. He didn't take out Saddam Hussein. He did exactly what he had been authorized by the international community to do. Uh, and I would also say that Gorbachev had a lot of simultaneous problems. Uh, um, and uh, the country was beginning to come apart. He already had uh, the violence in the South Caucasus. In January, one of the times when just as the war was beginning to start and there were votes in the UN, was when there was an attack on the television tower in Vilnius, uh, Lithuania, uh, and uh, the problems for that. And uh, so, uh, in fact, I think that uh, it, uh, although uh, some of his advisors uh, uh, wanted him to stay with, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein, uh, our position was okay. Uh, let him leave Kuwait, and we'll stand down. I mean, Saddam Hussein, and uh, and I think the Soviets tried to convince him, but he didn't. So they were they took. Um, uh, actually, a few months uh, for this to develop. And I th think we gave uh, Gorbachev and the Soviets every chance to have have it solved peacefully by simply withdraw <laughs> Saddam Hussein withdrawing to his own country. Of course, there were a number of sentiments in the Soviet Union at that time uh, in favor of of the Iraqis in favor of Saddam Hussein. Uh, there were demonstrations at our embassy, for example, but when I looked out at those demonstrators, they were, I would say, at least 80% students from the area uh, that you know were studying in Moscow. They weren't Soviet citizens, uh, basically, getting that excited. Most Soviet citizens at that point were just trying to get enough to eat and, and uh, and survive in what were increasingly chaotic times. Thank you, Ambassador. Quite a different picture from what we then saw in 2003 after the second Gulf War, but we'll come to that in- Well, the second Gulf War was course. quite different. Yes. Quite different in almost every respect. Yes. Um, I do want to come to really one of the elephants in the room in any discussion about the trajectory of the US-Russian relationship and that is the issue of NATO expansion, which you've already touched upon. Ambassador, there are many narratives and myths about what transpired in those crucial months in the early 1990s. Can you reflect for us on what was really promised to Gorbachev about the issue of NATO expansion at the time? I think the use of the word promise is probably not the right one. Here's the context. First of all, when President Herbert Walker Bush met with Gorbachev uh, in Malta in December 1989, they came to a very important agreement. One was that we are no longer enemies. The second was 
that the Soviet Union will not intervene in Eastern Europe if there's political change. And the third was the United States will not take advantage of changes there. Now, nobody, Frank Thanker, was thinking of the countries of the war pact coming into NATO or not. That simply was not on anybody's mind. You still had the Warsaw Pact. You know, the Berlin Wall had just come down and it was still uncertain what was going to happen. So uh, uh, December uh, of 1989, uh, Soviet policy changed very rapidly. Uh, when I came back from Malta, I made a, I called just a few days after this was over. I called on Shabanazi, the foreign ministry, to review, you know, what went on, and I asked him. I said that uh, 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 I understand your policy is that a decision on German unity is one for the future. He said, "Yes, uh, we know that's a question that has to be resolved eventually." Uh, but it's one that will be resolved in the future. We have great confidence that the new regime in East Germany is determined to keep its statehood. This is the, at the end of the first week in December. Just after Christmas, I called on uh, Ambassador Fallin, who then was the head of the Central Committee uh, 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 that he was known as sort of Mr. Germany as far as their foreign policy is concerned. And I asked him, I said, I understand you, uh, that you think this is a question for the future. His answer was, we thought it was a question for the future, but it's clear now it's one that's going to be resolved now. So they were very quickly seeing what was happening. And now in February, fairly early February, I think around the 10th and 11th, um, Secretary of State Baker came to Moscow. And at that point, we were trying to set up a framework for dealing with the question of German unity. And uh, we had proposed with the cooperation of the West Germans that it be resolved in a format of two plus four. Two meaning that the two German states would negotiate and try to find an agreement, and four meaning that the four victorious powers from World War II would then in effect review and either accept or not uh, the uh, decision the Germans made. And I know that uh, uh, when this was first floated uh, with Foreign Minister Shevardnadze uh, at a meeting in Canada in January 90, um, Shabanazi's first answer was, why not four plus two? And uh, Baker said, you know, that may work in arithmetic, but it doesn't work in politics. We have to let the Germans make this decision. And uh, then this was accepted. Now, and at that point, uh, the Soviet position was, okay, if the Germans insisting on unifying, there's one thing for sure. A united Germany will have to leave NATO uh, for us to approve. So when Baker came to Moscow in February, he was trying to convince Gorbachev that it was actually in the Soviet interest for a united Germany to remain in NATO. And after having, he had consulted with uh, uh, German Foreign Minister Ginscher on his way to Moscow, and he he proposed an idea, he prefaced it by saying, you don't have to give me an answer right now, but I want to tell you something to, you should think about. And the next sentence was, and I heard this so many times from him, I can quote it literally, yeah. uh, assuming there is no expansion of NATO jurisdiction to the east, not one inch. Wouldn't it be better? And then he went on to explain the advantages of having a united Germany and NATO, of keeping them their military united in one, and keeping an American role in military stability. Gorbachev answered 
immediately, I'll think about it. And he said, obviously, any expansion of NATO jurisdiction to the east is uh, unacceptable. But I understand what you're saying otherwise. And, um, and then he added, it had been our policy to try to exclude you from Europe. That is not our policy today. I want you to know that. We want to preserve an American presence in Europe, meaning military presence. Uh, because that can contribute to stability. He said, now, I don't think you need 300,000 troops, but we want you in Europe. And that is you know, part of our policy. Well, and actually, uh, Baker then repeated this to Shevardnadze. He repeated it to his delegation, including myself. In fact, as we rode in the car from the meeting, um, he recounted it to me and said, what do you think? And I said, he's going to buy because the case you make is a very good case. Now, when Baker got back to Washington, the lawyer said, no, wait, you can't include West Germany as part of Germany and exclude it from NATO jurisdiction if Germany remains in NATO. That's a legal impossibility. So this question was not raised again. And it there was no guarantee in the treaty, uh, the two plus four treaty that was finally signed in the fall. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, Soviet negotiators have said since then, they never thought they had a guarantee that NATO would not expand. They did have a guarantee that there would be no foreign, that is non-German troops in the territory of East Germany and that nuclear weapons would never be uh, deployed there. That is in the treaty, but nothing about NATO expansion. Now, I would also add, when we were talking about this, we were talking about Germany. We were not talking about the rest of Eastern Europe. Now, obviously, if anybody had asked me in the summer of 1990, does that mean that there would be no expansion into uh, Eastern Europe? I would have said, well, of course. <laughs> I mean, uh, although we're talking about Germany, and as a matter of fact, if you remove your, your troops, and uh, it was already evident that probably the Warsaw Pact wouldn't be continued. Uh, the, the East Europeans, once they went democratic, were very almost certain to pull out of the Warsaw Pact. And I would have said there's absolutely no need to expand NATO. Uh, uh, and uh, I would have considered that not a legal commitment, because it wasn't. Uh, but uh, one that, particularly in the context of the agreement, which was a formal one, we will not take advantage because nobody could look at the changes of Eastern Europe and then the subsequent. Now, I will add that it was not the Bush administration that expanded NATO. I'm quite convinced that if Bush had been reelected, he would not have. And uh, we would have used the uh, partnership for peace. And one can say, well, why did we? Well, first of all, because the East Europeans started demanding it. Uh, and you would say, well, they have a right to choose their alliances. Well, also the countries giving guarantees have a right to choose whom they guarantee or not, and whether that's a good idea. So this idea that somehow a country has a right to join an alliance when the alliance hasn't necessarily <laughs> invited them uh, is a rather, I would say, absurd idea. But the pressure did come from Eastern Europe um, and, uh, uh, and uh, was supported by many of our particularly smaller NATO allies. The real reason that Clinton went for it was domestic politics. I testified in Congress against uh, NATO expansion, saying it would be a great mistake, and that if it continued, uh, that certainly it would have to stop before uh, it reached uh, countries like Ukraine and Georgia, that this would be unacceptable to any Russian government, and that furthermore, that the expansion of NATO would undermine any chance for the development of democracy in Russia. Uh, and George Kennan had also said it was, you know, uh, the greatest um, geopolitical mistake of that uh, decade. And I think he was right. But why 
And when I came out of that testimony, a couple of people who were observing said, Jack, why are you fighting against this? And I said, because I think it's a bad idea. They said, look, uh, Clinton wants to get reelected. He needs Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Illinois. Uh, they all have a very strong East European. Uh, many of these had become Reagan Democrats on East-West issues. They are insisting that uh, Ukraine expand to include Poland uh, and eventually Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, so Clinton, uh, he needs those to get reelected and so on. Well, these are different issues now. But the fact is that I think the concluding issue there was domestic politics and really not an understanding of, uh, you might say, how best to handle the international relations. At that time, and I would say further on this matter of NATO expansion, that I think that the Clinton administration was quite disingenuous. Clinton personally told Yeltsin that the partnership for peace would be a substitute for NATO expansion. And Yeltsin said, that's great. It's a brilliant idea. At the very same time, our ambassador was instructed to tell the Poles, this is the first step toward NATO membership. So we were playing, I must say, to my dismay, uh, uh, duplicitous diplomacy at the time and being motivated largely by domestic issues, not what would really preserve a, uh, a Europe whole and free, which was the aim of, uh, uh, you know, of our policy in the first Bush administration. And when we said Europe whole and free, that includes Russia. It's not just all except Russia. Ambassador, fascinating. On the issue of a Europe whole and free, I do have one follow-up question to all you just said. I was intrigued by an argument that you make in your book, which is that, in fact, there was no need for NATO to expand eastward because, as you say, there were other ways those countries concerned could have been reassured and protected without seeming to redivide Europe to Russia's disadvantage. Could you explain a little bit more what other ways you had in mind? What could have been done differently? Well, in the military side, uh, uh, the Partnership for Peace, which all of the countries of Eastern Europe and uh, the former Soviet Union were invited to be part of that. And that allows, in a bilateral basis, the maximum amount of military cooperation. Uh, help, for example, to um, maintain civilian control over the military. In many cases, what they needed in Europe at that time was a great reduction of military spending uh, because, uh, 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 of course, in the 90s, we had the problems in the Balkans and uh, they, these are separate issues, but, you know, are relevant to politics at the time. But uh, with the breakup of Yugoslavia, which, by the way, was not something the U.S. engineered. We didn't want it to happen. It was, uh, and I know many people think, uh, particularly in Russia, that, you know, that was part of some grandiose design. No, it wasn't. But uh, without getting into the details of that, uh, I would say that it was very clear uh, that if we had been able to establish an all-European security organization, uh, the, that could have been done by expanding the powers of the, uh, uh, you know, of the uh, organization um, uh, uh, of European unity uh, uh, coming out of the Helsinki Final Act. It could have been done by uh, the Partnership for Peace uh, 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 between NATO and the individual countries, including Russia and uh uh, Ukraine and others who wanted to. Uh, it was precisely the thing that, uh, the, say, Yeltsin enthusiastically uh, accepted, and it was the th it was our moving off that into that. Now, on the other side, I would have to say that Russia never came up with a realistic proposal 
of how you know an all European security situation would work. Uh, and uh, the East Europeans, I guess, were so burned by the past and and, and things of that, uh, they um, uh, they began to think that only you know uh, NATO protection can solve their problems, although in many cases their problems are internal um, primarily and something that a foreign alliance was not going to help them. Uh, but these perceptions, uh, I think, uh, uh, began uh, to dominate in many ways. But on the whole, I would say the American motivation tended to be uh, to satisfy domestic constituencies. And I, I will continue with a, a question that's related really to the issue of, of NATO expansion and to me seems equally central when we debate US-Russian relations. So in your books, Ambassador Matlock, you discuss the concepts of empire, hegemony, leadership uh, at great length, and you warn of imperialist ambitions in the modern world. You also acknowledge the pride and the distinct traditions of the various nationalities within the Soviet Union that you encountered on your travels. And you, you even recall a leitmotif in your book uh, saying that when you encountered people in the Soviet republics, they would say to you, please don't think of us as Russians. We are not Russians. On the other hand, you point to Russia's complicated past with Georgia, with Ukraine, when you make the argument that we, the West, failed to take into sufficient consideration Russia's worries about these countries' future relations with NATO. So let me ask you this. Does Russia have a right to a sphere of influence in what's called the post-Soviet space? Or put differently, how far should Western countries go in taking Russian concerns into consideration when they're formulating their policies towards these countries? That's an excellent question. My answer would be, first of all, it depends on what you mean by sphere of influence. Obviously, Russia or no other country uh, should use the idea of sphere of influence the way, say, the Japanese did in the 1930s when they occupied Manchuria uh, and saying that uh, they occupied Manchuria and in effect made it a colony because it was in their sphere of influence. That, in my opinion, is not a sphere of influence. That's pure imperi imperi uh, imperialism and aggression. It's quite another thing when you say that any country is going to be hypersensitive to other countries, particularly if they are in alliances that seem hostile to coming close to their borders. Of all the countries in the world, the United States should uh, understand this. It's not a matter of international law any more than I would say gravity is a matter of law. I mean, gravity is there, and you can deny it. Well, you know, okay, we never passed a law on gravity, but you damn well better pay attention. <laughs> and, uh, um, because, and I, as I said, of all countries, the United States for two centuries has followed a policy that no external power can have either a colony or be you know, a member of a for, uh, military alliance in the entire Western Hemisphere. Think of how we reacted to Cuba uh, and so on, and are still reacting. Now, the idea that any Russian government could sit still for, say, Ukraine, which had been an integral part of the, uh, of the country, rightly or wrongly, for over two centuries, um, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, they could sit still uh, for Ukraine becoming a member of NATO, uh, among other things, it would eliminate uh, one of their most important naval bases, which they legally hold 
uh, on that territory uh, in, uh, of Crimea. So that to, uh, to say that, well, it's aggression. No, I think that the idea that uh, Russia would react negatively and that Russia has the power to prevent others from coming in is absolutely true. Nobody is going to fight a nuclear war. And I would say that never, and in my opinion, in the history of the United States or of Western Europe, has any of our security depended on precisely where the line is between Ukraine and Russia. That is a very difficult, a very emotional issue, and one that I think that foreign intervention has created more problems, though it is basically an internal problem. So you can say they have no right to a sphere of influence. They are going to exercise a sphere of influence if they feel threatened, and any other government would also do so. And I think we have to understand that and not keep thinking that things are abstract. Oh, we have a right to do this. We have a right to do that. Rights? There is no international authority that creates so-called political rights. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, uh, the idea, second, I would say, as far as NATO expansion is concerned, neither Ukraine nor Georgia would qualify because NATO supposedly never takes in a country which has internal problems. And the problems with the Donbass, the problems with Crimea, the problems uh, with North and South Ossetia of Abkhazia, these uh, are internal problems. And the idea being, oh yes, if they're in NATO, Russia wouldn't interfere. It's not so much Russian interference, it is the local problem. And yes, Russia has supported one side. But on the other hand, uh, I would think of there's hardly another country you can think of that would not react if it feels its own security is room. And one of the basic problem has been the development over the last 25 years of the feeling that Russia is an adversary or an enemy or something like that. There is no reason in the world to create that atmosphere, but step by step we have created it. Their reaction to our steps have intensified it. And it is reaching really absurd levels today. Uh, and at a time when we are trying to deal uh, with a pandemic, at a time when we are increasingly being uh, affected by uh, climate change, by global warming, at a time when uh, many of our countries are, are trying to cope with uh, the floods of refugees and so on, to be disputing, fighting, using resources over uh, these, you might say, border issues um, by methods which actually exacerbate them rather than solve them, I find totally irrational. We have far, far more common interests with Russia and with China than we have differences. And why? Our politicians can't understand that. It's beyond me, but I attribute, you know, most of it to our own domestic political scene. And uh, I think this, unfortunately, it's true of most countries, uh, particularly large ones, that uh, domestic politics trumps everything. Thank you for that, Ambassador. I do have one question which relates a little bit to your day-to-day -day activity of being an ambassador on the ground in the uh -huh. Soviet Union. So you stayed on as ambassador when George H.W. Bush came into office. And as I read in your books, you would soon send three telegrams to Washington, D.C. in 1989, where you would say, look, the Soviet leadership will continue to be preoccupied by internal reform, Perestroika will not bring fast improvements in the Soviet economy and Soviet foreign policy will be less threatening militarily. So there might be a window of opportunity here. 
And then, of course, there's also the famous telegram that you sent in July 1990 when you advised the White House uh, to plan for a contingency of a collapse of the Soviet Union 18 months before it happened. I really want to ask you, how were you making those judgments at the time? What clues were you looking for? What were you doing to analyze and read the situation correctly on the ground? I was talking to people. Once Gorbachev gave us the opportunity to have wide contacts in society, uh, the, so, suddenly, uh, by 1988 and 89, the Soviet Union itself was opening up. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we would invite um, all, a whole range of uh, political leaders uh, uh, to social functions. For example, I traveled to 12 of the republics. Uh, I was not allowed to travel to the Baltic countries while I was ambassador. Um, uh, and um, our staff uh, really had contact with these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, developments as they were developing. And, um, well, there were many things going on. Uh, one of them was that genuinely by Certainly by 90, by 89 and 90, uh, the Gorbachev Central Committee was actually protecting democratic forces as they emerged in many republics. I mean, when I would go to Tashkent, I would find that there were, you know, groups of people who were Democrats who were translating the American Constitution into Uzbek and so on. Uh, and the local communist authorities would have suppressed them, uh, but the Gorbachev Central Committee kept them from doing so. I remember in 90 talking to Vasil Bukow, uh, the famous Belarusian writer, and he told me that if uh, that his writings would be prohibited for publication in Minsk, but he would repeal to Gorbachev's Central Committee in Moscow, which would order uh, the Belarusians to publish them. In other words, Gorbachev's policies were creating, uh, really, well, helping the forces that eventually brought it down, but at the same time, these were the democratic forces. And if, if the, however, what really caused me to write, send that first one about the poss um, a message in July 1990 uh, that um, the Soviet Union could collapse was because I found that the Russian elite was beginning to talk about the advantages of throwing off the Soviet Union. I should explain that many Russians quite inaccurately thought that the non-Russian nationalities were, as I would say, feeding off them. That, uh, you know, uh, and that uh, uh, I know some would say, look, these Tatars, these Georgians, they'll never be Russians. Why should they be part of Russia? Uh, and uh, in, uh, in, in a sense. And I began to, and others began to say, you know, the Soviet Union, it really should become something like the EU. We don't need a unified state. And I said, you know, and these were the people who were supporting Yeltsin. These were the people who were beginning to win elections uh, when they had them. And I said, look, if the Russian elite no longer wants to preserve the Soviet Union, certainly, you know, well, we knew the three Baltic states uh, were going to insist on going. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, Georgia was almost out of Moscow's control. Uh, uh, already by that time. And my, my conclusion was, look, uh, as the country opens up and becomes more democratic, if there is not a strong push by the Russian intelligentsia, the Russian informers, to keep the union together, they're not going to be able to. And that's why I would say, you know, by the way, you didn't ask the question, but I will point it out. We did not have one single spy in the Soviet Union the years I was ambassador. We got all of our information by talking to people, by looking, 
It was not a matter of intelligence, but I am convinced that we understood better than Gorbachev himself did what the problems were because the KGB was giving him distorted reports. They were saying, oh, this Lance Burgess in Lithuania, he's just a rabble rouser. He doesn't have any support. So another conclusion to this is that uh, we did not reach those conclusions through espionage. We did it the old fashioned way. We simply looked and particularly listened to what was going on. And this concludes part one of our conversation with Ambassador Jack Matlock. Please watch part two to hear more from the Ambassador on missed opportunities, ways forward, and recipes for successful US-Russia diplomacy. <laughs>